Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our summer series on risk management and adjustments. All right, well, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna start off today um, and we're gonna do a quick poll. John's gonna come on here in a second. We're gonna do a three question poll. All right, Johnny, why don't you, uh, why don't you tell me a little bit? All right, sure. so, it out. How many people filled it out here? Uh, 163 of the 192. There's a couple folks oh, just good. finishing it now. So good. appreciate that, guys. Appreciate that, everybody. I, yeah. Well, like closing a Chicago poll. Yeah, where the polls <laughs> will be closed in eight seconds. They're closed. <laughs> All right, polls closed. We appreciate you guys filling that out. All right, question one, uh, what strategy did you do the most in 2017? The number one answer, 29% was butterfly. And pretty close behind that, 22% was credit spreads. And then last but certainly not least, 11% uh, for iron condor. Those are our right. top three percentages. All right, how about the brokerage firm you use? Brokerage firm, uh, kind of a landslide. We got 40% using Thinkorswim. And then uh, just kind of a smattering of, of everything else, 5, 6, 7, 8%. Uh, so definitely the winner there was Thinkorswim TD Ameritrade. Was there, was there a number two or no? Um, Tied for, so second would be Options House, and then we have a three-way tie for third uh, with <laughs> Options Express, Interactive Broker, and Tastyworks. Interactive Broker and Tastyworks. And what numbers were those? Uh, those were 6%. Six, six, and Option House was n number 2. 7%. Yep, just by 1%. <laughs> and again, Option House and Trade Monster are under the... The auspice uh, now of the E-Trade, yeah. The auspice or mammoth arms of of uh, E-Trade. <laughs> e yeah. um, the ever-loving arms, yes. Yeah. And uh, all right, and then the third question. Third question, we've got uh, live option trades. So 30% uh, of you do 1 to 10 option live option trades per month. 26% uh, do 11 to 30 trades per month. And then 9% do over 30. 30. All right. Well, that gives us a little feel of as far as the people that are here today and kind of where they're coming from in the walks of life. Uh, I appreciate, uh, Johnny, you want to make me host here? Okay. Uh, so let's jump in and we'll just cover a couple topics. Uh, so this is our risk management and adjustment series. We'll be doing this uh, every Wednesday at 11 o'clock. In August, this is the first one, we'll do two more. Today, we're gonna to focus a little bit about how to protect yourself against the next big market move down because uh, would it be fair to say that's on people's minds a little bit, right? Um, and I just wanna discuss that. Um, all right, this is for educational purposes today. Today's outline uh, we already did number one, so we're getting moving. Uh, poll of favorite option strategies. Number two, for those who aren't familiar with, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, our philosophy, income trading philosophy uh, at Sheridan Mentoring. I'll talk about this complete options portfolio. We'll look at the market over the last 12 months, the last five years, make a few points, give a little perspective. I'll talk about the proper use of a long put, when to use it, proper duration, how long to hold it, um, and, and we'll explain that. And then I'll give a balanced butterfly example just because I want to talk about um, different things and, 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 and how you should be thinking type things. So hopefully this is a help to you. Our philosophy, I just call it shared philosophy, but... Um, um, this philosophy has been 
uh, around for a while. Uh, I think I learned a lot of it. I was at the CBOE for 20 some years, and uh, I, I think it's when I say shared in philosophy, um, some of it's a little more unique how we do things in the retail realm, which is different than most out there. But, you know, most of it was picked up over 20 some years being at the CBOE. Um, but I definitely tweaked it because I still think most, a lot of people, you know, some of the people there might have been a little more directional. Um, these rec these sessions, um, today's session will be recorded. Um, all right, non-direction. So our philosophy, we do mostly income trades. Not all, but mostly income trades. A positive theta. Dan, what does that mean, income trades? What does that mean, positive theta? It means that every trade we're putting on, if this is the underlying, and this might be the graph of the position, this is the price, we're going to have a range, this is an expiration graph, where we make money, right? So if you're a speculative trader, you need the market to move generally uh, for you to make money or not move in a certain direction too far. But here, an income trade is basically the options we're selling are going to decay quicker than the options we're buying. That's positive theta. The options we're selling are going to decay quicker than the options we're buying. So we're going to have something called positive theta working for us, positive decay. Okay, is everybody clear on what income trades are? Uh, another key tenet of what we do here at, in, at Shared and Mentoring is non-directional repeatable trades. And, and what does that mean in English or Spanish is deltas are near zero when we put them on, but tweaked a bit based on price levels and VIX. But, but we're putting repeatable trades on, and you're going to see here this kind of says the same thing, consistently putting on same trades every work, week or every two weeks price diversification. And, and, and so I'm not – you know, a lot of people may think, how many of you are of the uh, thinking that how many are of, of you are of the how many of you how many of you are of the thinking that hey, I might only put a trade on when the volatilities are a certain level. How many of you might so how many of you might say yes to that? I will only trade some maybe an income trade or some type of trade when the volatilities are a certain level, or I may only trade if we're at a certain price point, right? Would anybody say yes to that? I only trade maybe if we're at resistance, or maybe I trade if I think we're going up, or, or maybe I trade. What we do is we consistently put on the same trades. Either you're going to put them on every week, or if it's a longer duration trade, maybe every two weeks, that gives you some price diversification because um, you're not putting them – you know, every week you're putting on some new trades. As far as durations, and this is a big point, um, for durations, um, <clears throat> how many people do their durations of their trades? Maybe over 30. So how many, let, let's do this. How many people do their, how many people do their trades a, 1 to 15 days from expiration, or B, 30 to 70 days to duration. So how many people do, as far as the majority of your trades, um, A, 1 to 15 days from duration, B, 30 to 70 days, A, 1 to 15 days, B, 30 to 70. Now, what's the right answer? You're getting a lot of A's. You're getting some B's. What's the answer? Which is best? Which is best? You know what the answer is, which is best? Whatever you do, right? Whatever you do is best, right? Whatever, what food is best to marry? Whatever food Mary eats. 
what food is best for Jeff. Whatever food Jeff eats is best. Agree? My point is, in reality, is one best. No. And what I do is give a general philosophy with our students that, you know, if I had a, you know, whether it be a $10,000, let's say I'm going to trade $10,000 of butterflies or $10,000 of credit spreads, I might put 70% in durations for me personally, 30 to 40 days, and uh, 30% of the of the of the capital uh, in durations, uh, maybe 15 days and under. Now, do some people like longer term trades better than short term? Yes. And, and and will some of will some people that trade 30 to 70 day trades tell you that there's absolutely you know good reasons? why they think 30 to 70 days uh, are better? Sure. Are they right? Absolutely not, right? Are people who tell you that, you know, one to 15 day trades are worse or better, they're absolutely wrong. The point is there's pluses and minuses to both, right? Agree? And, and one isn't better, right? I mean, there's really good compelling reasons for both. For 30 to 70 day trades, the compelling reasons are, you know, and again, it, it all depends on the strategy. But for 30 to 70 day trades, you know, as the price moves against you, it doesn't hurt you as much as it does on shorter term trades in terms of price risk. But you have more volatility risk with longer term trades. Um, but with shorter term trades, you can trade, uh, you can get higher turnover of inventory. You know, if I do a seven day trade, let's say an iron condor, I can put on four, I can get out of four trades, right, in, in a month. But with keeping my capital low, I mean, I, in other words, I put my capital into one trade, take it off, and put another. I have no overlapping or anything like that. And that's a big plus. If I'm doing 70-day trades, I can't have the yields, generally, uh, like I do with shorter-term trades. Not gonna, I mean, I could, I could be a horrible – I could be, a, in my opinion – I, I want to make sure what I tell you opinion. In my opinion, I could take a relatively bad short-term trader, and I would heavily bet that yields over a year – I don't mean horrible, but let's say an average to a little below average short-term trader who trades seven to 15-day trades, put him up against a very good above average uh, 60 to, or 50 to 60 to 70-day duration, I can't even imagine a scenario where at the end of the year, the great 50, 60-day trader will have better yields than the, than the, the uh, Average trader, I, because you're, it's just you're you're doing so many trades, and uh, you're able to put on four trades without increasing your capital or having more capital uh, than the 60-day guy. It's just, it, and the other thing with short-term trades are, you may put a trade on Monday and be out by Wednesday, right? But here's my thing. The one thing I want to encourage everybody is this. Most of the people that I talk to that tell me, Dan, I don't like 7 to 15 day trades, and they have a long explanation, or I don't like 30 to 60 day trades. I'd say 90% of the people I ask when they tell me that, and they'll give me their reasons, I'll always say, how many live trades did you do consistently of 7 to 15 or 30, oh, few. How many have you done in a row? Few. You know, to me, on the short-term trades, if you haven't done 20, at least 20 in a row every week, hey, how do you know, right? You, you don't, right? Anyways, all right, so shared in philosophy, mostly income trades, non-directional, repeatable trades, 
Uh, deltas are near zero, but we'll tweak them based on like right now, price levels are very high, VIX is low. So we're gonna tr tweak our short Vega trades a little bit. Trade a small number of vehicles, mainly SPX and RUT and a few liquid stocks. Why mainly SPX and RUT and not 15 to 20 smaller positions? Here's the, here's the, here's the point. Um, SPX and RUD are very well uh, diversified. They're very liquid. They trade a lot. SPX is made up of 500 stocks. RUD's made up of 2,000. You know, would you rather trade 20 small positions that are probably in the SPX or the SPX? I'd rather trade the SPX, right? You've got tax consequences. I'm, I'm using less commissions. Um, they're very liquid. And you know, if something happened, I'd rather put out one fire than put out 20 positions in, in, in uh, stock. So that's, that's, um, that, that's, you know, why we'll focus on uh, mainly SPX and RUT and then some of the more liquid stocks that trade the most, right? Uh, your Amazons, your, your Apple, some of those. Um, All right, uh, consistently put on the same trade. So these are some uh, shared and philosophy. Volatility levels and technicals are not driving my decision process. You know, do we, you know, when we look at technicals, yes. Is it a good tool? Yes. But I think what happens with technicals is it becomes your Charlie Brown security blanket, in my opinion. That's my opinion, right? You get up in the morning, should I put my pajamas on? Let's look at Fibonacci. Should I have orange juice? Well, let's see if the these trending lines from 1852 are, you know, come on. It's a, it's a stinking tool, right? Use it as a tool and not as your life decision maker, right? Same with volatility levels, right? If, if I only waited over the last four years for volatility levels to be at a certain high level to sell, I ain't trading much, right? Excuse the ain't. Um, uh, one thing, again, that is just, you know, again, I've tried to bring from the years in the pits, but tweak it a little bit here. On every trade we put in, I'll do a four-step risk management process for every trade. I'm going to pick it up here just so we're done around 12, um, and I'll try to uh, uh, go through this. We can always talk about some more of this stuff uh, to go. Uh, but I want to get through everything. We have a four-step risk management process for every trade. One, how do we set it up? You know, do I set up a butterfly the same when VIX is 9 and the SPX is at all-time highs as I do if VIX is 18 and SPX is 300 points lower? No, we're going to tweak the Greeks a bit, right? Uh, every trade. So how we set up the trade, the Greeks of the trade at the beginning, is is really important. Now. We'll get into the fact that the last three, four years in the market have been straight up, so people have been kind of tweaking their trades a little more neutral to bullish. Uh, the second thing for every trade we put on is we'll have a profit target and max loss, right? So there's no Dorothy from Wizard of Oz risk management. You know, we, we go up, the trade's going against you on a credit spread. What do you do? What do, most, what do some of you do on a credit spread when it goes against you? I hope it comes back. It usually comes back. I talked to my neighbor. She promised me it'll come back. Uh, let's see, the SPX is down. Uh, it, it'll come back. It always comes back. It'll come back, right? Let me explain to you, right? That's not risk management, right? Hoping is not risk management, right? Um, one thing, you know, should people start if they're a beginner at SPX or SPY? And, you know, either one is good. But, again, remember, even if you're a beginner, can you do, you know, can you do a $500 trade? Can you do a four or $500 butterfly in SPX or Russell? The answer is yes. Can you do a four or $500 iron condor, $600 iron condor? Yes, you can do a five wide iron condor, right, for under $500. You can do a, a butterfly cheap. So I would rather beginners start with, 
you know, I mean, if they, if you can't do a three or four hundred dollar trade, you're probably not going to be trading. I would rather the beginners work on the vehicle that I think is better for them. SPX. Not that spy isn't bad. I mean, Thinkorswim uses a lot of spy, and uh, Tom at Tasty Works uses spy, and I think it's it's fine. It's not bad. It's just what I found, and we, you know, we love SPX. It works better for many of the reasons I mentioned. Um, profit target and max loss at every trade. So. You know, let's face it, the biggest problem for all you credit spreads out there or what, credit spread traders, is this. If I ask any of you in the credit spread business, tell me about your last two, three years. Here's what some would say. Hey, Dan, I was doing good. I made money six weeks, six months in a row or six weeks in a row or whatever, and then one trade blew me out of the water or one trade destroyed me. Would anybody say that, that, you know, one or two trades, the market really moved, and boom, it hurt me, right? Um, here's the problem with that. If one or two trades took away three or four months of income, was there really a solid, was there really a solid risk management plan? No, 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 not at all, right? And I think that's important, right? Um, when to adjust, uh, when to adjust, uh, I think that's the most important thing in the world of risk management, when to adjust, um, next to max loss. But even at, at max loss, you need to get out at the right time, right? It's important, very disciplined. When to adjust is important, and then how to adjust. So every time we do a trade, it has that. Um, all right, and, and again, here's the key. Um, I just want to mention something. Any strategies that we're talking about, um, you know, as far as that we do at Shared Inventory, whether it be the short-term strategies um, or whatever, um, the good thing is, um, the good thing is that you know, Sheridan community is a live trading community. All the students, you know, that, that's the working at. We're working at every, you know, if you go to, we just finished a class um, for four weeks. Uh, and every time we have a class, it's live trade. So, so when we're talking yields and different things like that, it's all based on live trades. Right, you know, has stuff been back tested? Yeah, but live trading is much more uh, important. Um, and uh, all right, strategies we design require very few adjustments, one to two, and can be explained in probably 10 to 15 minutes. Becoming a craftsman takes more than 15 minutes, obviously. We teach you how to think and not rely on just a system that will change. Uh, discuss strategies and adjustments over the four years, last four years in a bull market. If you look at, here's a one-year SPX. Um, here's an SPX price chart, uh, 2467 today. So here's where we are today. We've hit 2490. But if you look over the last year, which is basically, we've been in a low option volatility environment, and we've been trending up, right? If you look at, here's a five-year SPX price chart, right? So today we're at 2467. But if you look at a five-year SPX uh, price chart, you could see 2013, right? Up. I mean, let me head a little down there. 2014, right? 2014 up. This was more a little... Uh, Call this more, what you call it, trendy type, but slightly up. Uh, and then you had the kind of that bump down 2014-ish. Uh, as you get into 2015, um, down then up. But for the most part, for the most part, we've just been trending up. Agree? 
we had some bumps along the way, but nothing that really stayed down long, right? And this is a five-year period since February 2016 lows here of 1850. The market's up 33% to 2467 today in one and a half years. That's pretty stinking good, right? So, but also that, you know, when you talk to option traders, is it important to have the right perspective, right? In other words, in other words, um, here's the key. If you did covered rights or put credit spreads or cash secured puts consistently over the last four or five years, even with just a little bit of risk management, but overall, would you have looked like a genius over the last four or five years for the most part? In other words, if you did covered rights, cash secured puts, put credit spread. So if you're talking to a put credit spread trader and he says, I've got the best credit spread system in the world. I've got the best covered rights system. I've got the best cash secured put. I tell him, I don't believe you. Why? I bring up a stinking chart, right? Right? I bring up a stinking chart, right? And say, hey, if you had a delta neutral or bullish position, a bullish position like a put credit spread, covered right, or cash secured put, um, you should have made money, right? And, but but the dis distressing thing is this, until we go down, will we know if the people who are making money had a clue? We won't know. See why? Because, you know, if I ask you put credit spread traders or cash secured put people or, or covered right, how many adjustments have you made on the downside? What would be your answer in the last three, four years? How much maintenance on the downside in the last three, four years on those bullish positions like put credit spreads and cash secured puts and covered rights. I'll give you an answer, right? I'll give you the answer. Not thinking many. So all I'm saying is, is it good? I call those couch potato strategies, strategies that have risk in one, basically more risk in one direction, not much risk on the upside. But what's also happened, folks, is, um, in the last three, four years, even in our community, what's happened in the last three years or four years is what people have done is, even with iron condors or butterflies or calendars, you can tweak the Greeks at the, it, it, at the beginning. You know, if you're running your butterfly or a broken wing butterfly or an iron condor, you can tweak it a little bit so you're leaning maybe neutral deltas or maybe a little bit long and you have less risk on the upside, those have, those have benefited deeply. So it's really, how do you set it up? But if, if we had, you know, for all the people, you know, if you have, and I'll call those a modified iron condors or butterflies or calendars, uh, but in butterflies or iron condors, you can modify them a little bit that you're leaning more neutral or slightly long delta, so you have less risk on the upside, more risk on the downside. And, and, and those will benefit from an up market, but if we go down, again, it's different. No matter what strategy you've been doing, you haven't had many downside adjustments. So just bring a little bit of perspective. Here's a complete options portfolio. Um, and and real quick, I'm just giving you something to throw darts at. This is kind of how I look at a complete options portfolio, even though we focus more on this part of the portfolio. But I'm just giving you something. If you had a $10,000, $100,000 portfolio, and again, we trade mostly this part of the portfolio. And um, But I'm just giving you how I look at this, how I look how I look at this uh, um, you know, an options portfolio. First of all, you might have 10% in cash 
or 10 grand of this for opportunities and adjustments. Some people might have 20%. And again, whether you have a portfolio margin account or which most people probably have, like a retirement account or a margin account, um, uh, you know, you might use 10%, 10 to 20% uh, in cash. I have 10% uh, cash here. If you had a portfolio margin account, I'd probably use 50% of cash. <clears throat> we can get into that another time. So I might put 40% or $40,000 for, I call it, non-directional income trades like calendars, iron condors, butterflies, double diagonals, or butter, broken wing butterflies, modified butterflies, or iron condors. Um, next, 40% or $40,000 for long-term retirement income trades with a slightly bullish bias over the next year. I'll call these couch potato strategies. They're basically leaning a little bit long, right? Put credit spreads, covered rights, cash secured puts, uh, long diagonals, or you maybe you buy a leap and you sell a, a near-term out-of-the-money call. And then I put modified or broken wing iron condor or butterfly trades where you're leaning neutral, the long delta is at onset. And, you know, if, if this is a graph, a modified iron condor, if the price is here, it might look something like this, where you might have, uh, you know, less risk on the upside, more risk on the downside, right? Um, by either maybe neutralizing out the iron condor or narrowing the upside or something, and same with a butterfly, right? You might have with a butterfly in more over the last two, three years, we do a lot of modified broken wing type butterflies, whether they be out of the money or at the money. And, you know, where, again, if this is the price of the underline, you might have the butterfly with risk like this on the downside, right? But the upside might be something like this. Right, so over the last three years, we've modified many of these strategies a little bit with the Greeks to make them more conducive to the upside. Again, here's the bottom line. Here's the, but you know, again, am I saying this is how you should do a option portfolio? I'm not saying that. I'm just trying. I'm trying to show you where do all these trades fit in. Where, you know, uh, where do they fit in? Like I might put 10% or $10,000 for directional trades, one day to three months duration, maybe based on technicals or fundamentals, maybe use a long call or put, debit vertical trades, credit spreads, uh, also trading a company's earnings with long options, vertical spreads, iron condors, blah, blah, blah. Why did I list these same strategies I mentioned? iron condors and everything, as non-directional income trades in this category. In other words, this would be more your spec stuff. And if you get better at it, you'd do more than 10%. But the point is, if I'm doing a iron condor or short strangle in earnings, that's different to me. That's much more speculative because I can't adjust, right? Apple closes at 100 bucks, it opens at 110. I either get, you know, I can't do anything until it opens. So I you know, it's like using a baseball bat in Chicago to beat somebody or to play baseball. The main purpose is to play baseball, right? And so iron condors to me are a non-directional spread, but if I'm putting them in for an earnings situation, it's a bet. You know, I don't think Apple will move this much, so I'll put on an iron condor. But that's not how we typically use uh, an iron condor. So I'm just giving a some ideas how we do this. Um, but, uh, you know, we have people in our community that are just trading one or two strategies in SPX. That's it. Maybe a butterfly or an iron condor or something. So, um, anyways, let's move on. So, let's talk about if you're long a 30-day 10 delta put in SPX. And I just want to, um, again, David says, how can you manage all that? As I said before, we're not putting on all that, right? We're just saying, where do these things fit in? If somebody does a covered right, how would that fit in an options portfolio to me? 
how would a cash secured put fit in? You know, so so what it looks like in practice is, here's what a typically a student insured and mentoring might do. The guy might have one or two trades on. He puts a butterfly on. Uh, and he puts maybe a calendar on, and that's it, two trades, right? And and you, you maybe you put them on every week or every other week, because again, with weeklies, you can put a 30-day calendar on every Wednesday. You can put a 30-day iron condor on. So, so what most of our students will do is they might just trade a couple trades. That's it, very easy to manage. But that's in your kind of non-directional income trade. But how many of you, got into options through covered rights or cash secured puts. Anybody? Does any of you do, most of you do some kind of covered right or cash secured put. That's a different trade. So we might have students that are just doing a butterfly and a calendar every month until they're 90, right? But your cash secured put covered right, those are different trades. Dan, why are they different? They're stinking bullish, right? As long as the market keeps neutral to up, you're, you're safe, right? But so I keep that in that that piece of the pie which I talked about, right? I keep that in this uh, long-term retirement income because it's a little more bullish than these trades, right? So do we have some students that will do cash secured puts, covered rights, and they might they might do it in the indexes. Uh, just do that, or they might pick a few stocks, but that's different than their normal trading. So we might have somebody that does a butterfly and an iron condor every week or month. That's it. And then they might do a few cash secured put in Apple or something else. Um, uh, all right. Again. Wallace used that word that I don't like, better. I've never said better. Wallace says, is there any case to be made to do only short-term trades? If they are better, why know the other ones? Why do the other ones? They're not better. There's pluses and minuses. Uh, and and they're, they're more profitable, but again, you know, it's, 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 it's pluses and minuses. There's more price risk. You gotta watch them a little bit more. Right, but you know they are more profitable, but they're more work and they have more price risk. So I mean, for some people, I agree with you; they're more comfortable, right? And they are, I think, more more for someone who knows what they're doing. They're more definitely more profitable. Um, but um, anyways, so here you're long a 30-day 10 delta put in SPX. So if I bought a one sep eight 23.30 put at five dollars and fifty cents. With SPX of 24.68, that's an out of the money put, right? So I'm buying a 30-day put, it expires SEP 8 expiration. I pay 550, but my put is out of the money, right? And let's say it's a 10 delta put. I'm just using this as an example. It's a 23.30 strike. The Greeks of the trade. I'm short nine deltas because I buy a put. My theta is negative 31, so I have negative time decay. I'm long vague. If the volatility goes up, that benefits me. Does everybody see that? Everybody clear what I'm doing here? I'm buying a put. Uh, this is, I'm using a think or swim graph here. So here is the expiration graph. Here is the graph of the put today. Here's the price of the underlying and I'm buying the 2330 puts. So a couple things I want to point out here is this. If you buy a put today with 30 days to expiration put with a 10 delta, so it's an out of the money, where 2468 and I buy a 2330 put, you can see this is the picture of the graph today, right? So the picture of the graph today, this is the zero line in the profit graph, it's all above zero, right? It's all above zero. This is the expiration graph. So you can see at expiration, um, it's not going to look as good, right? 
it's not going to look as good because you're going to get decay, right? So as you look at a graph, as an option trader, should we be focusing on the expiration graph or should we be focusing on, I'll call this, what the graph looks like today, T plus zero? So as an option trader, should you be focusing on the expiration graph or the T plus zero? Should you be focusing on the expiration graph? Pete, I see P-E-D, S-A-L-D-A, Pete Salda. I'm happy if you want to send me an email, give me a call after. You have a lot of things on your mind as far as this type of stuff. You could call me and we could talk. That way it's just instead of I'm not going to be able to answer all your questions or your comments, I would say just relax, grab a lemonade, you can call me tomorrow, and I can settle your stomach a little bit, right? As far as this, this may be a little different to you. So you can relax. Uh, if, if I could hug you, I'd hug you. But, yeah, you're not, you know, we can't solve all your problems. Not problem, but your concerns in two seconds. All right. So this is your T plus zero curve. Red is your expiration graph. And this is an out-of-the-money put. But the thing I want you to understand today is buying a put is like renting a Navy SEAL. But once you stop paying your rent, the Navy SEAL goes away, and, and it's not the same security, right? So if you look at a, you know, the day you buy the put, if we have a big move down tomorrow, you're safe, right? But if you buy a put and we look 14 days into the future, right? So let's say nothing happens. 14 days into the future, if we buy the put, and the underlying Here's our long put. This is a 30-day put. We're going 14 days in the future for a 30-day put. Um, if you look at the current price, so if we sit there on a put that we paid $550 or $550, in 14 days, if we stay at $2468, we're down $395. But what's significant, at 24.43, 25 points down, that put will be underwater. And at 24.21, we're still down. So what are we saying? If we buy a 23.30 put 14 days in the future, if nothing happens, We lose money all the way to almost 2443. Now, if the volatility goes up, it can change it. But what I'm saying is when you're buying an out of the money put, you've got to be very careful as you get closer to expiration. It's not going to help you as much. And I'll give you a guideline here. So you can see in 14 days, I'm not going to make money unless the volatility rises um, quite a bit. Uh, until we go under 2420, right? So I need, if this is the current price, I really need us to move 14 days in the future. So here's something just in your in the business of buying puts for any kind of protection, and I'm going to talk about it. Um, usefulness of long puts is about 20% of its duration. So here's my guideline for when you're buying long puts as an adjustment or a hedge. Usefulness of long put is about 20% of its duration. Then it starts hurting you as it gets closer to expiration, exception being a huge down move in the market. Then it'll help you. Uh, get out of the huge would be 5 to 7%. We don't get many of those. Um, I would get out of the put or roll the put up or out to a further duration at the 20% point. So what I'm saying is this. If I buy a put 30 days out, The most I'm going to keep it is 20% of the duration, which would be six days. So if it's the, in this example, I'm buying a put 30 days from expiration, I'm only going to stay in it about six days. Why? Because in, for the first six days, for most of this T plus zero curve will be over the zero line. It won't be too bad if things start going down. Like in this case, um, in this case, 
Um, if we go even 20, if we go down 20 points, I'm making money. If we go down 40, 50 points um, in six days, I'm making money. Much drastically different than 14 days to expiration. So I have to know basically when is my out of the money put going to start hurting me? And at that point, I either sell it out if it's a put and buy a put maybe two or three or four strikes higher, or I generally would maybe go out to a different expiration. So I think this is very important when you buy out of the money puts. If you just use this as a guideline, uh, you won't say, wow, I bought a put. There's only five days to expiration. The market was down 4% and I lost money. I'm going to call my lawyer. No, you don't need to call your lawyer. You need to go read a good option book and read about uh, time decay of options and duration. So I think that will help you in the world of puts. Now, let me just ask you a question. So how would I use a put? What duration and strike? Here's a problem. What if you guys bought puts as protection because you think the market's going down and the market kept going up? What would happen? So have any of you bought some puts or anything over the last month or two against maybe your portfolio or against your trades? Have any of you bought puts? Now, what's the problem if you bought puts and you're leaning short deltas? What's the problem if we keep grinding up? If you keep picking spots to buy puts, what's the problem? What's the problem if you keep buying puts is protection and we keep going up? In other words, what you lose money, right? If you're getting short. And so I'm going to talk a little bit how, you know, because to me, over the last year or two, um, you know, a large percentage of our students who are doing this consistently and applying good risk management have made money. How have they made money? Well, they're not betting every time we go up. I put the big one, right? So how would I use long puts? Um, would I buy a put at the beginning of a trade and lean short or buy at an adjustment point? I would more buy it at an adjustment point as we start going down if I needed to, but um, you got to be careful how many short deltas you get at the beginning of the trade. I would uh, maybe tweak my trades to incorporate a long put in them. And maybe I'll, um, I'll go over some examples next week of how I would incorporate, um, next week I could talk about how I would incorporate long puts into totally neutral delta positions, right, that aren't leaning one way or the other, but I have my long put. But, but for example, if you look at this trade here, folks, here's a 30-day SPX balance butterfly. Now, let's talk about it. So we're at 2467 when I took this example today, SPX. I'm going in and selling two at the money 2470 strike. For a butterfly, if we're between strikes, in other words, it was a 2467 when I was looking at this, there is no 2467 strike. So I always will go the next strike up. It'll make me less, um, it'll get my deltas closer to neutral. So I sold two 2470s, SEP 8, 38, 30 days out. I bought one SEP 8 2420, so there's 50 points difference here. And I buy one 2520 call, 50 points up. So this would be called a 50, 50 wide butterfly, 30 days from expiration. But at exp let me ask you a question. This is the expiration graph. I'm putting it on basically at the money. Does at expiration does it look pretty balanced? Yes or no? At expiration does it look pretty balanced? The graph. Here's the underline right here. At expiration does it look pretty balanced? The answer is yes, right? Yes, it looks pretty balanced at expiration. Now here's my Greeks. That's why the Greeks are so essential. My Greeks with the VIX again, we're still relatively low environment. Here's the date. 
by Greeks are deltas 12 deltas short for every one by two contract. Now this trade cost, this would be a debit transaction, all call butterfly pay, and the cost would be $18.50. So the margin for one contract would be $1,850 if I did it this wide. If you said I don't have much capital, you know, if you did it 30, you know, you could do it five, six hundred dollars if you just did it uh, narrower instead of 50 wide, maybe 30 wide. But the point is this: this is my graph at expiration. But what does my graph look like today? This is how my graph looks today when I put it on. So do we look better on the upside or downside? This is the underlying today. And that's the way my graph looks today. Do I look better on the upside or downside? Up or down? I look better up or down? The answer is down. Why? I'm leaning 12 deltas short, right? So here's my thing. Even though it's a balanced butterfly, it looks pretty balanced at expiration, because I'm already leaning 12 deltas short, let me ask you a question. Do you think it would be wise to buy a put for downside protection? Yes or no? you think it would be wise to buy a put at downside protect? No, because I'm already leaning short delta here, right? And I'm going to have to adjust quicker on the upside. So as I said, next week I'll show you how to incorporate more downside protection in a delta neutral position. But in this position, I wouldn't just go in and get extra long short deltas, right? I'm already short. And to me, 12 delta short for one contract on a butterfly is too short to begin with, right? So I think you have to be careful. How do you incorporate some protection on the downside without death by a thousand, uh, whatever that saying is, on the upside? Because again, we've been slowly grinding up for a long time. And so, we're looking for income every month. Every month we're looking for income, right? We put the same trades on, same capital. We're, you know, we have students in our community that are looking to make, you know, whether it be a thousand a month or thirty thousand a month, but it's every month. So they can't get in the thing of, okay, this is the big one. This is the big one. I'm going to buy puts. No, no, no. That's not trading, right? If the market starts going down, we'll adapt. But again, if I'm already short deltas, I have some protection. Um, I'll discuss portfolio protection maybe one of these two weeks, a little bit beta weighting. I'm not a big fan of beta weighting, but we'll, um, we'll talk about it. Um, and I'll tell you why. So anyways, we went over quite a bit. I better run here. But... Uh, if you have any questions, you can email me, dan at sharedmentoring.com. Now that I have a feel of where everybody's at, next week will be a little bit less uh, getting to know you and jump right into more meat and more examples. We talked, I think you have a little feel of my philosophy, so we'll get into, I'll go over some strategies next week and just show you how I would structure some of these, how you can uh, trade an upside market. Uh, grinding up like that and uh, make money and different things give you more examples. All right, well, have a great day, everybody, and we'll see you next Wednesday at 11 o'clock for part two of the series, and we'll jump into next two weeks should be a little more fast and furious since we laid the foundation here. All right, take care, everybody. Thank you.